All right, so I'm gonna go live now, or you good? Okay. Okay, um, hopefully we're, we're live now. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're watching this either during the live stream or after, I uh, uh, hope everything's going well for everyone. Um, I'm joined by Draft Science and just want to say, you know, Gary, thank you for uh, taking part in this. I really do appreciate it. I want to get good feedback on, um, you know, these experiments and what kind of conclusions we, we might be able to reach about the results of these experiments. Um, just a couple of things before we get started. Uh, I want this to be a positive conversation, and that includes people in the chat. If you're in the chat, again, please be respectful. Um, I, I don't want this to devolve into a, you know, people just insulting each other. And again, that include, that's included in the chat. Uh, I've been just kind of chatting with Draft Science before we uh, got started, and I think he's in the same, uh, he's in agreement on that with me. Uh, I, I'll let him speak for himself in, in a minute. But uh, I, Gary, I do appreciate you uh, taking part in this. Uh, do you want to kind of say anything before we jump into things? Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm also grateful. Like I said, I have for a long time been trying to solicit this very kind of conversation. I've offered people lots of money to have the conversation to really pick through all of the experiments and all of the details to find out what's really credible here because all the science is kind of weak. Um, the MB squared wasn't presented 350 years ago with a big pile of evidence proving it. There was no evidence of four times the fuel to go twice as fast or any of that kind of stuff. It all depends on clay experiments and these little niche moments in time where this was established to be a truth. And it wasn't established to be a truth based on a big, you know, on a, on a mountain of evidence. It was a tiny little shred of evidence. So I could compare it to like the Eddington experiment, you know, validating Einstein and it wasn't a very credible experiment and then it was never repeated and all that kind of stuff. I'm just saying the science is kind of weak and I appreciate anybody willing to talk through that to demonstrate that it's not as weak as I think it is. <laughs> okay, show me it's not weak evidence. Okay, and, and I, I would, you know, disagree on the state of what the evidence is for, you know, concept of you know, the textbook definitions of momentum, the textbook definitions of conservation of energy, including kinetic energy is one half mv squared. But again, we'll get into that. And again, I appreciate you uh, uh, taking the time to talk through this. So the experiment that we've been talking about and that you've been kind of asking for, I'm going to share my screen. So uh, I do just want to check in the chat. Does check in the chat if people can hear me and hear draft science. And when I share my screen, is this showing up uh, decently? So if I uh, draw on my screen, you know, I know it's gonna be about a 20 second delay, but if anyone in the chat could just say, yeah, it's working, or you know, if there's anything that can be improved, just let me know. So the basic experiment that has been, uh, has been requested is if we have a lever and there is some fulcrum point in the middle, the basic idea is we're going to take different masses and launch them at the lever. So different masses with different velocities. Let's call this mass one and initial velocity one. And on the other side, we've got another mass, maybe half the mass at double the distance, or maybe a third the mass at triple the distance, some relationship between uh, where object one is hitting the lever and where object two is being launched from. And the question is, what happens when we actually launch this object? How fast is it going? Is it or is it not conserving momentum? Is it or is it not conserving uh, energy? Um, you know, basically anything kind of like that, kind of getting into some of the weeds on how this thing actually works. So Gary, is that kind of the same experiment that you were yeah, yeah. So I did a part of this experiment where I made a lever and I oscillated it with energy and it oscillates perfectly. OK, with the one mass, um, you know, oscillating at half the speed of the half mass, which moves twice as much, twice the distance. So it oscillates in gravity perfectly. So 
that to me indicates pretty much that I could stop that oscillation at any point and those masses would move freely into space. And you could argue that they have to have this relationship where one is moving twice as fast as the other. So it sort of already, in my opinion, proves that momentum is conserved. Okay. Um, do you want to go into uh, more detail on, let's say we're, let's say we're going to do the experiment where uh, this mass is two, this distance is, for, for some, some demos that I'm going to use later, I'm going to use uh, 0.5 for this distance. And this mass would be one, this distance would be one. Does that still meet your criteria? Double yeah, the mass that's, that's, that's exactly what we were just saying. They're going to match a higher velocity to a, a, a deceleration to an acceleration is how I would look at it, right? We know one is moving at slower speed. It's going to decelerate at a slow speed. And the other one's going to have to accelerate at a higher speed because it's always going to be moving twice as fast, twice the distance, twice the speed. Okay. So do you want to take a, a couple of minutes just to kind of highlight what your predictions from this experiment are and how you uh, uh, kind of made those predictions. Well, I'm saying momentum is conserved. So obviously the object has it, whatever the force is, I'm gonna get the same force out on the other side. That's my argument. So the force will be consumed on one side, the force will be released on the other side and exactly the same force, exactly the same momentum has to come out of the other side. So basically if this is, uh, you know, if this object has uh, M1 times V1 initial, you know, the velocity that it had before hitting the bar, then this one over here should have M2 V2 final, its final motion matches what we started with. So if I made it, a, if I did it the opposite way and I, I put the five, the, the lighter mass in, and I was going to launch the heavier mass, this would essentially be the experiment where you have a five ton train going 10 miles an hour, and you're going to create, uh, uh, you know, the 10 ton train going five, or vice versa, like I said. So that's why I'm saying it's, it's puts kinetic energy in jeopardy, because it's basically saying that the 10 ton train going five is the same momentum, and it is the same energy. Um, I, again, I want to make sure you have full opportunity to present your position. So do you want to like, if, if you ever want to like write any diagrams on your screen and I'll stop my share so we can kind of see those a little bit better. Um, just open invitation. Just let me know if you want to, uh, want to do that at any point. Yeah, I guess the key point, I think everybody can kind of understand is the, the idea is, is one side, there's going to be a deceleration. One side, there's going to be an acceleration. And the point is, is you're basically just converting those. So you're just saying the slow deceleration of the heavy object will create the high acceleration of the lighter object and they will be in exact proportion if you have those distances exactly correct. So they're basically allowing you to do a Newton's cradle, okay, where Newton's cradle doesn't allow you to use uneven masses, this converter allows you to use uneven masses and completely transfer the energy from one object to the other object. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to, th this might take a bit because I've got to introduce some things on uh, angular momentum, but I'm going to kind of present my position. It's going to get a little mathy. I have like a whole bunch of notes. I'm not going to go into this much math, uh, definitely, because that's going to be a little bit uh, more than I think is going to be useful here. So I'm going to kind of present my position for what I think that this thing should do. And then we'll talk about the actual experimental setup, which I've got parts of it here to kind of see if we agree that this is a reasonable setup. Um, okay, so first, here's my argument as to why the momentum isn't going to work, why this momentum argument isn't going to work. If I have, let's say I have just, you know, two objects running into each other, you know, let's say Two objects, they hit each other, and then afterwards they're moving in some way. I think you would agree that if we have M1 V1, and this one's just not moving, and this is M1 V1 final and M2 V2 final, we should get conservation of momentum. Is that, are, are we on the same page with that? 
Yeah, except we don't, we, and we know we don't get conservation of kinetic energy. So I just throw that in. I, I will, we'll, I'm going to disagree with that one, but we'll leave that for now. Um, so if I was just looking at this object, would the momentum of just that object be conserved? Like if I just said it starts with no momentum, later on it has M2, V2 final. We can agree that that's not conserved if I just look at that object, right? I, I don't know what you mean by conserved. It had no energy, and now you're giving it energy from outside, so to speak. So obviously, conservation has to do with inside of a system. You have to put energy in from some other place. So yeah, there's no conservation within the object. OK, awesome. I, I agree with that. So we're both saying that you need to consider the entire system. You need a closed system in order for this to work. Is, are, are we agreed on that? No, I, I'll pick the universe as my closed system. Um, so I, I mean, I, I'm really not. I'm, I'm really not going to play with what it defines a closed system. In your card experiment, I could say the track uh, means your system isn't closed. The Earth means your system is it's tied to the Earth. I, I mean, it's these are minutia points. So I don't. I don't. I, want, I don't want to give a blanket agreement to this closed system thing because there's no such thing as a closed system. But we are going to have to, you know, pick something that we're actually going to measure because we can't measure everything in the universe. Like yeah, let's, so let's just forget about relativity arguments and let's just point out that, OK, we have one thing that has energy in the system. I could have a firecracker. I can have an object moving. I don't know what the problem is. We're saying that's the source of the energy and we're just going to follow that energy. We just want to know what that energy does. Is that a good enough thing? If I shoot a bullet at a brick wall, I just want to know what the bullet does to the brick wall. I don't have to evaluate anything else. I just want to follow the energy. Okay, and, and that might be a point where our two models differ because in momentum, if we can say we've only got internal forces, this is one of the things that I was kind of highlighting with uh, Newton's Principia. The argument is if there are only internal forces, like just forces between these two objects, um, in that case, we can use this conservation of momentum. And I'll, I'll give that to you, frankly. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll give you the, I'm just saying I'm not going to agree to some un, uh, you know, unending uh, proposition. So if you're just going to tell me that we're just going to deal with these two objects as the experiment, I'll say fine. Okay. All right. So my argument as to why momentum, linear momentum, isn't going to work for this thing is because at this fulcrum point, that is attached to something. That's attached to the Earth. And when this mass hits, there are going to be forces at that fulcrum point. If I didn't have a fulcrum, this bar is just going to be knocked downwards out of the way. Something is holding that in place. There is a force there. And that would be a force external to the system. It's very similar to what we what you've kind of mentioned with the newton's cradle and it hitting the wall saying is that momentum where does that momentum go is it just transferred to the earth and i'm saying yes if that thing is connected to the earth and you make that hit that momentum would be transferred to the earth okay i mean you can make that argument that's fine i'll just make the counter argument that it doesn't happen that there's no way the fulcrum can tell the difference between the light object on the far end of the lever and the heavy object it just see, feels a weight it's both nine pounds to the fulcrum. The fulcrum can never discern the difference between the nine pounds that's real and the nine pounds that's artificial. So there's a point where our two models differ. So we can, we can kind of say that. And again, these experiments are, again, my, the, the way I approach this is we've got two models and those two models, we're trying to make the predictions for some experiment. And then if those two predictions are different, we're going to actually do the experiment to see which model matches the data. Does, does that, is that something that you agree? Yeah, yeah, I'm just saying that obviously the experiment needs to be done. It should have been done 350 years ago. So the fact that these simple experiments have never been done, that we can't already know in advance what the answer is, is almost kind of funny, right? I mean, it's almost ludicrous that we have to now in 2023 have a discussion about what a lever does. So it's this kind of a, a miraculously bizarre fact. I, I disagree on that this experiment hasn't been done, but I don't have any references on hand. So I'm just 
we're just going to focus on this experiment that we're going to try to do uh, uh, in a bit. So that is my reasoning where in my model, using conservation of momentum is not going to work because there's this force at the lever, and that's going to change things. Also in my model, if this object is moving downwards and this object is moving up, in my model, momentum direction matters. If I have one object with a momentum going downwards and one object with a momentum going upwards, that literally can't be the same momentum because they have different directions. I know your model says differently. So again, we're just trying to identify differences in our models. So right. what we... Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, could you apply that to the fact, will you agree that it will oscillate, that this lever in gravity will oscillate if I poke it? If I poke it with energy with a five mass at the extreme and a half, you know, a 10 mass at the at one distance, will you agree that it will oscillate perfectly? Uh, I agree that it will, if we have this system uh, set up, so we have a bar, here's the center, if we have a two mass here and a one mass here, I agree that if we poke that, it'll start rotating with a constant rate because there would be no net torques. Those two torques would balance out. Um, but if it's good, if you're talking about oscillating back and forth like this, uh, in my model, something would have to be a little bit off axis. All right. Well, I can tell you I have a video on my channel where I do the actual experiment and it oscillates perfectly hundreds of times, like maybe 50 times. Um, and it just goes up and down, up and down. And, you know, it's so send, I, I, send, send me a link. Send me a link and I'll, I'll have a look at that. Um, so what we need in this case instead is conservation of angular momentum. So angular momentum. And basically, if I have, if I'm looking around some axis, um, angular momentum will be conserved if there are no external torques. So this is conserved uh, if no external torques. This is very similar to the model of momentum where linear momentum will be conserved if there's no external forces. It's a, it's a very close analogy in you know, these two parts of the model. So this angular momentum, when this object is coming in, uh, let's say it hits and sticks to it. Okay. We've got some initial angular momentum. And again, in, in my model, I, I'm not gonna go into the full details on this, but this depends on the linear momentum of the object and how far it is from the rotation axis. So that the ability of this thing to cause a rotation depends on how much momentum does it have and where on the bar is it hitting. If it's hitting further from the bar, it's gonna be able to make that thing rotate more. And on the other side, you know, after this thing uh, starts to rotate, let me uh, move down a little bit. Sorry that I'm going into a lot of detail here, but I, I do think it's important and there's, I'm, I'll try to keep it more brief than I have been keeping it. So once this thing gets hit, mass one is going to slow down. It might not stop entirely. Uh, I know in one of your videos you were saying we don't want it to bounce. And the other object is going to be launched. In this case, my final angular momentum, well, it's whatever the final velocity of this object is. Again, I should have drawn this a little bit closer to the axis, so. So I should have drawn this close to the axis. There. Uh, times that R distance. Plus the same thing for the launched mass. So this is M2 times whatever its final velocity is times whatever that distance is. Plus any effect from the rotation of the bar. Uh, where this is the moment of inertia. And this is the angular velocity, how fast it's rotating.
So in this model, we can set these two angular momentas equal to each other. And I'm not going to go through the whole, the whole math because it takes a little bit. But if we have a case where M1 is equal to two kilograms, or just let's say two masses, because we're just going to say, you know, double the mass. If M1 is two and R1 is 0. 0.5 and M2 is equal to one and R2 is equal to two, um, and we're assuming the bar is very, uh, the bar is very light, so low mass bar, and that object one sticks to the uh, uh, sticks to the bar, so there's no bouncing off. So low mass bar M1 sticks. Um, the numbers I got are that the final velocity of object two should be two thirds the initial velocity that this thing had before it hit the bar. It's not gonna be double that value. It's actually only gonna be two thirds. So there's a very significant difference between what your model predicts that the other mass should be launched with uh, uh, twice the initial velocity of mass one and mine under these circumstances, it should only be two thirds of the velocity of one. Uh, so if I apply this to a Newton's cradle, so you say in a Newton's cradle, if I hit a larger twice as big mass with a, a, a half as mass, you're saying that I gain this two thirds, which is 133 more momentums. The, the Newton's cradle would be a little bit different because we don't have these, uh, these R values. We're not conserving angular momentum for the Newton's cradle. Uh, we're conser conserving linear momentum for that one. I mean, that's just a qualification on the velocity. So we're just saying that the velocities are still going to still the same momentum. So you're still the rotational momentum has the same rules as the Newton's cradle. There is no kinetic energy correlate to angular momentum. So we would both agree that if the five mass on the outside will rotate exactly at the same speed as the 10 mass on the inside those two things will roll down a hill at the same speed because the angular momentums are exactly the same. The, the angular momentums are the same. Sorry, the angular velocities are the same. But the velocities are not the same. The 10 masses uh, is, is half the R. The, the linear velocities would be double. The angular velocity, the way I define it is just how many, how many rotations does this go through per second? If they're on the same bar, it's going to go through the same number of rotations per second. That's what I mean by this angular velocity. I, again, it doesn't make any difference. I'm just saying, so you don't agree that if I make a wheel and I have a five mass on the outside of the wheel and I have a 10 mass on the inside of the meal, it's wheel, they are two different wheels, one with 10 mass on the inside, five mass on the outside. You're saying that they will rotate differently. Yes, absolutely. I, I'm saying that I, you know, there's a ton of physics videos where they roll these objects, you know, hollow objects versus filled objects. How could it possibly have more angular momentum? It's a because five mass moving twice the speed of a 10 mass moving half the speed. How could they have different angular momentums? Because for a rotating object, this moment of inertia depends on how much mass there is and where that mass is located relative to the axis. And for a single object, this is actually M times R squared. If it's further away, it has an additional effect. You're, mu you're muted right now. You're, you're muted. We can't hear you. Right you're now. using the kinetic energy version. So you've just created a kinetic energy version of the of the very thing you said right down here. LP equals MV IPR plus blah, blah, blah. So you've changed it to squaring now. You're squaring the velocities. I'm squaring the, uh, the distance that these masses are from the rotation axis. Okay, you're squaring the R. It doesn't matter which one you're squaring, really. So I'm just saying you're squaring one of the numbers. So frankly, for, it's two different formulas. For the math, it very much matters which one you're squaring. Because again, we want to be very, very specific in what values we're looking at. Um, and again, this is another point of disagreement between us because you seem to argue, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, you seem to argue that momentum, force, mass, a lot of these, uh, um, energy, all of these things are essentially equivalent to each other. 
And in my model, there are very, very important differences between those. I'll go back to I'll go back to the original argument made by Leibniz. Okay, this was an all or nothing argument. It wasn't any semantics argument. It was a real argument about one is real, one is fake. So I'm just saying there's no point in having the word momentum anymore if kinetic energy is true, because there's no reason to conserve it. There's no reason to care about it because it doesn't mean anything, um, and vice versa. Frankly, I mean yeah. one of them has to be real, one of them has to be fake. You can't have this duality. I, I would disagree with that position. Um, let, let, me, let me give you an example of why I disagree with that. Okay. Um, we're, we're going a little afield, but let me just kind of finish this uh, part by saying, I can make a prediction with my model. I'm making a prediction about how this experiment should go. You've got a prediction and I've got a prediction and eventually the experiment will uh, kind of highlight those differences. Um, Let's say I have, we, we agreed on this, this uh, equation for conservation of momentum in just a one dimensional collision, one object runs into another and either they stick together or they bounce off of each other, you know, they do something. Um, we agreed with this one, right? I, I, whatever, just go ahead. I'm, I'm saying, yes, I'll agree that the only thing in the experiment are these two objects and we're just trying to, we'll say they're in empty space and we're gonna figure out what happens to them. Okay, so my point here is that momentum, conservation of momentum gives us this equation, but it is not sufficient to figure out exactly how these objects are moving. Because if I have these two final velocities, if I have only one equation and there are two unknowns, we can't solve those for those unknowns. We can't predict how this thing is going to move in its entirety. We can find out this combination, but we can't figure it out in its entirety. And the additional piece of information that we need is what is happening in terms of energy. Is this an elastic collision? Is this an inelastic collision? In all collisions, no matter what kind of collision you have, doesn't as long as there are only internal forces, doesn't matter if it's magnets pushing them off each other, doesn't matter if it's a, a spring or a direct contact, or I don't know, they drag across each other and it's friction acting between them. If it's only internal forces, according to my model, these equations should match. It gives us information, but it is not sufficient to fully identify what's going to happen to this system. We need some additional information and that's where energy comes in. Uh, I would just simply argue that these are all experiments should have been done a million times by now. And there, we yeah. should have explicit answers for every single one of them. We should know what exactly happens when you hit a one pound object into a two pound object in space. What happens? And if we know the coefficient of restitution so we can figure out how much kinetic energy is conserved, we can do exactly that. These experiments have been done a lot. Uh, again, I'll, I'll say I've, I've seen hundreds of them on YouTube, okay? And they're all uh, giant, at least 50% of them have a catch to them. I mean, I made Professor Lewin's experiment kind of famous because it has blobs of clay on the carts. I mean, the masses clearly can't be what he says the masses are. I mean, you know, so it was obviously for demonstration purposes. It wasn't a scientific experiment. But anyway, I don't want to, I don't want to argue, okay, those, that issue, right? We're going to say, we're going to do this lever experiment. Now, my only qualification to how you're doing it is we have to do it with a two mass and a two mass. Okay. We have to do it with a half mass and a half mass. We have to first prove the lever conserves the momentum when the energies are the same. So here's, here's going to be, I think a bit of a sticking point because again, my model does not predict that if you have a one mass and a one mass at equal distances, it's not going to launch it in that same way. And let me kind of explain why. If we go to uh, M1 equals, let's say M1 equals one is the same as R1 is the same as M2. Everything is just going to be one in this equation. Okay? And we're also going to assume that this moment of inertia, it's small. We're going to say that the bar is very, very small. If I take these two equations, this conservation of angular momentum idea, we're going to get um, everything here. The only thing that's not one is just that initial velocity of object one. 
And that has to equal this whole equation. Uh, M1 is one, R1 is one, so we get V1 final. Uh, M2 is one, R2 is one, we get V2 final. And when we identify that, okay, one mass stuck on one side, they're at the same distances. So V1 final, if this thing is rotating and they're at the same distance, whatever V1 final is, that has to be the same as V2 final. Which means I can take this and say V1 final is the same as V2 final. So that's two V2 final. So the velocity of object two at the end is going to be half the velocity that the original object had. All right, well, I'm, I'm just going to say, okay, I've done part of this experiment by oscillating a lever and clearly there's no indication that there's any difficulty in this lever oscillating perfectly. And it couldn't oscillate perfectly if there was half energy being created somewhere or only half the momentum was being conserved. It has to be conserving all of the momentum. Again, I disagree because we've got that fulcrum point. And again, I, I can't say anything for or against the experiment that you're citing. Um, again, please, you know, after this, send me a send me a link and, and well, let's and say, just give me the benefit of the doubt. Let's just say I'm telling you it works. Okay, with a two mass and a two mass, it oscillates perfectly. With a one mass and a one mass, it oscillates perfectly. With a half mass and a two mass, it oscillates perfectly. But I don't think that that oscillation is the same as the setup that we're talking about here, because we're talking about was that oscillation started by impacting one object with the other ob uh, with the second object and having it stick to it. No, it just has to do with the it's perfectly balanced lever. So and all it's I, not the all same. I did, all I did was poke it with energy and it oscillates back and forth with a five mass out here and a 10 mass on the other side at one distance. It oscillates perfect. I did it with a one quarter mass actually. So I had four times the swing over here and one, you know, one unit of distance swing over here and it oscillates like a hundred times. And once the, after the collision has happened and we have a system where it's now, those objects are stuck in place and it uh, has that balance. That's why I was agreeing that the final velocity of object one and the final velocity of object two in this balanced case, those will be the same, but that's not the same as how fast was the thing that was coming in and actually came in and hit the lever. That's where the experiment that you're describing doesn't address this particular question. Right, so you're saying only half the force went into the oscillator. What I'm saying is by the time this thing, when this thing hits the bar, by the time that thing's stuck in the bar, that object has slowed down, which means that that bar isn't moving as fast as it would have to for this thing to be going at full speed. It's not going to be moving as fast once it hits the bar as we started with. That's the point that I'm making. Uh, yeah, well, my only counter argument to that is, is that's exactly the point I'm making is that the deceleration on one side is perfectly going to match the acceleration on the other side. And so, it will half decelerate object one, which means it half accelerates object two. So again, you're saying it's half. I'm saying it perfectly matches the excel deceleration to the acceleration. There is no loss of energy. But okay, you're saying you're saying a, the typical teeter totter doesn't really work. Okay, that we're losing half the energy every time it goes up and down. There's half the energy is being destroyed. If you jump onto it and have that kind of impact. Yes. Well, why would it make any difference how the impact happens, whether it's gravitational pressure or whether it's something falling that's collected gravitational pressure? Those two pressures are the same. 9.8 meters per second is 9.8 meters per second. Because what you're trying to compare is how is this object moving before it has even seen a lever? Before it's even seen the lever, how is that object moving? And how is that value going to correspond to how fast this thing was launched? Uh, look, I'll, I'll grant your point. You're making a prediction. I'm saying I just want the test done. If you're going to do this lever test where you do a two mass against a two mass or a half mass against a half mass at the appropriate conditions, just to verify 
that you're conserving most of the momentum. And if you're not conserving it, then we can just stop doing the experiment because it's useless. I mean, if you're losing half the velocity of the object, then clearly all my predictions would be moot and irrelevant because half the energy is being lost. So, okay, so this is a, a central point in terms of method that I, I really want to like honestly talk about. Um, your model is making a prediction about how this thing would go if we have that you know one to one mass. My model makes a different prediction. So if your position is, I don't believe this system is properly calibrated, this, this lever system is properly calibrated unless it matches my prediction. Oh, I'm just making a simple argument that if the lever doesn't conserve momentum when I haven't even changed the masses, okay, with the same mass, and it can't even exchange the momentum, then clearly there's no conversation about levers conserving momentum because it fails to do it even when these masses are the same. It can't even do the Newton's cradle for frig's sake. If you can't accomplish the, the Newton's cradle, then why would I have a why would I even talk about levers as useful devices? They clearly lose half the energy right off the bat. Let, let me flip this for a second. Okay. Suppose I said, I am only let's say you were doing an experiment. And suppose I said, I am only going to think that this system is properly calibrated when we do the one-to-one -one masses, if we get half the velocity at the end, because we must conserve angular momentum. If I made that argument and you were doing an experiment and said, I'm going to refuse the outcome of your experiment unless in our calibration test, I get this specific result, would you accept that response? I don't even know what you're saying. I'm saying to you, I don't have any confidence in levers at all. I will not even talk about them anymore if they can't conserve the momentum when the masses are the same. When the two masses are at the same R distance and it can't even conserve the energy at all, the momentum, why would I even worry about it? It's not a relevant subject anymore. You've debunked uh, levers as momentum conservers, okay because it's not conserving your model of momentum. We have different models of momentum. I'm saying I will no longer test. argue it. I'm saying the argument's over. You've won the argument. If levers can't even conserve the momentum in the Newton's cradle kind of way, where the masses are the same, if it can't conserve the momentum, then I'm never gonna talk about levers ever again. Okay, so, so that is a test that we can do and if it matches your prediction, then you're correct. We can, and uh, we'll, we'll go on to the next one. If it doesn't match your prediction, then the lever thing you, you would admit, okay, levers aren't conserving momentum in the way that I think they are. They're not conserving the momentum, kind of obviously, but you could say, yes, in my way, they're not conserving momentum because clearly one object's going half as fast as the other object that went in, you've lost half the energy. So if you've lost half the movement of, of things in the universe, if half the motion is gone, then clearly you haven't conserved the momentum. Again, I would say we've got different models of momentum. In my model of momentum, it shouldn't be conserved because again, we've got this external force, but in my model, I'm also including angular momentum and that I'm saying should be conserved. So, okay. Let me, let me make one other point that I, I did want to kind of check. Um, in, I, I watch your, your kind of do's and don'ts about the lever setup. Uh, I appreciate you uh, uh, making that one. So one other thing that I wanted to say is you wanted there to be no bounce in the object when object one hits the lever. Is that correct? Well, I'm predicting that if you have the locations correct, there won't be, just like there's no bounce in a Newton's cradle. A Newton's cradle doesn't bounce, okay? The, the first ball knocks all the energy into the second ball and it's clean. I'm saying that the lever allows you to do Newton's cradle with uneven masses. So I'm basically saying if you get that distance precise, and the only thing you have to add to it is, as you pointed out, is the weight of the lever. So the weight of the lever has to be uh, known, and you have to change that R just a little tiny bit to account for the fact that you lost a little energy moving the lever itself in a horizontal circumstance. So we're talking about the horizontal 
rather than the vertical experiment. Okay, in okay. the vertical experiment, you have a counterweight that compensates for the weight of the lever. So the leader becomes the 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 lever becomes moot because of that counterweight. But in the horizontal case, you have no counterweight. So you do have to actually use some of the energy to spin the physical lever itself. So there's a tiny difference in the energy. So you'd have to move that R a little bit, but I'm just saying it shouldn't bounce. If you have those distances just right, the deceleration on one side, I'm saying will perfectly match the acceleration on the other side, and you will accomplish the task of moving most of the momentum into the object. So object one, if I made object one out of clay and I did it again, making object one out of, I don't know, like whatever clay, material no, no, you clay, clay deforms permanently. So you're using the energy up moving the clay. So obviously you're not putting the energy into the object because the clay is moving. But again, the, the point that I'm making is there is some, uh, it, it's going to depend on the properties of the both the properties of the objects that I'm throwing at it and the properties of the lever. If I make the lever out of like some flexible material, um, there's going to be some some bounce to that. Well, obviously we want to evade that. So I used aluminum, uh, you know, an aluminum rod, you know, hollow rod. And so that was pretty rigid. So I'd argue it something like that would be an appropriate lever. Okay. So you're saying we we don't want bounce. We want it to just kind of hit and kind of stick and as that thing rotates. So my argument, I, I went through the math for this yesterday. Let, if we have a bouncy ball kind of coming in and we have this same mass ratio. So if I, I use a, a, a bouncy M1, um, I went through the calculation and the final velocity of object two, in that case, will actually be greater. I got four thirds times V1 initial. My model, in, in my model, again, this is, can be another prediction that we can test. I can try both a case where it sticks or hopefully has as little bounce as possible. And I can try another case where, you know, it bounces off the side. My model, uh, again, the classical physics model says if there's no bounce, the final velocity of object two should be two thirds of what object one started with. If there is bounce, if it flexes, it, if that kind of object coming in flexes and then springs the other one away, you're actually going to get more velocity out of that case. So right, right. I, I, I and I would argue, you know, I guess you could we could share the patent on the free energy machine, but in my opinion, you've just made free energy then. So that's just miraculous, frankly. The the way I got this equation involved using conservation of energy. There's in, in a little bit, if we want to go through the, you know, is energy created when I have an elastic collision and we seem to in your model make momentum. We can talk about that. Uh, you know, I'm just saying, show me. I'm just saying, clearly, okay. if you can make this thing happen, I'm saying I can make a billion dollars on it. So that's all I'm saying to you is, is if you can make something come back with more energy than it went in, I'm saying I can I can capitalize on that. I can make the machine so I can make the free energy machine. If you can make this happen, I can make the machine. I, I will try to show you this happening. But I'm also saying it's not actually making energy in the way that you seem to think it is. So again, that's a difference in our models. This is something that we can test. Yeah, momentum is real in my model and momentum isn't real in yours. So in my model, whenever you have more momentum, it's a real thing. It pushes stuff. It moves stuff in the universe. Momentum is a real thing. Uh, again, I would say both are real things. They're useful in different uh in different specific circumstances it makes calculations easier more difficult depending on what kind of system you're talking about but um did you have any other comments that you want to make about these predictions before we talk about the actual how i'm actually going to build this thing all right um yeah no i just qualify again that i have done some of these experiments so it's not like i haven't done anything to try to weed this stuff out and i'm just saying that you know if i have a lever and it's perfectly oscillating with these different angular rotations that is a five mass rotating at twice the distance and a half a twice mass rotating at half the velocity and all of that crap it is proving that the angular momentum is the same there is no difference in the angular momentum on the two sides of the lever and so i'm just arguing that 
you know, you can say that there's a calculation that says there's a different amount of energy, but there really can't be a different amount of energy. It's an oscillator. Can, can we agree to let the experiment and the outcomes of that experiment determine if this is possible or not? Because again, our, we've got two conflicting models and we want, if we can't say that, sorry, let me, let me back up a second. Going back to this, if I were to just say, this has to happen and if it doesn't work, then you know there's something wrong with the experiment would that be a fair assessment on my part uh, well i'm just saying that okay you don't have my explicit experience i'm just saying i personally witnessed the lever oscillating i personally saw it doing it i know that's a fact so you're saying you're doubting that fact that's okay you're allowed to doubt the fact i'm just saying i saw it i videoed it it happens and the clear implication of it is is that you're saying half the initial energy was destroyed, fine. I'm still saying the angular momentum is clearly still the same and there is no squared function. The angular momentum of the, the half mass moving twice the velocity is clearly the same angular momentum as the 10 mass on the other side moving half the velocity. Those momentums are the same and um, I witnessed it. So I'm just saying that's as far as I'll go. So you can do an experiment proving that doesn't happen, but I'm just saying I saw that happen. Once again, I, I think we might be disagreeing on when we're talking about linear momentum and angular momentum, because those are different things. And in that angular momentum, it does depend differently on how far away the object is from the axis. But let's, let's leave that aside for now. So um, I'm going to stop my share for now and let's actually look at this, uh, this setup. So I haven't put this whole thing together yet, but this is the general kind of setup to the experiment that I'm thinking. Okay. Um, I'm going to have two carts. So this lever is actually pretty good in low friction. It's, it's rotating it when I don't want it to. So on one side, I'm going to put the cart that's going to be launched. On the other side, I'm going to throw a cart at it. Um, I know you were saying you wanted to use uh, uh, pendulums. I think the pendulums and try and get that very, very accurate measurement of how high does the pendulum swing is going to be much, much more difficult than me just putting motion sensors on the ends of those two tracks. They're not aimed at each other, so we should get pretty clean data. And I'm going to use the carts to throw the to throw one cart at the other, and the other cart should be launched away. I'm going to both be measuring it with the motion sensor, so both motion sensor routes will be there, and I'm going to have video set up with those kind of markers, so you can also do the video analysis if you want to. Um, in terms of the in terms of the lever itself. Uh, I made this little holder. Oh, let me. Uh, my apologies. My video sometimes gets uh, a little fuzzy unintentionally um, on Zoom. I've got this lever. It's got quite low friction, so hopefully there's there's uh, bearings included on this thing, and I'm going to be mounting different kinds of levers on top of this thing. Uh, I'm still kind of working on the exact best way to uh, get that mounting to make sure it's nicely centered. But again, this does have a very low friction bearing on it. And right before I do the experiment, I'll just, you know, WD-40 this thing uh, to make sure that it is as low friction as possible. Um, any any kind of comments or about this setup so far? Yeah, well, as long as the center of the lever is on the center of the, how that thing rotates, obviously the, the, the mounting hardware doesn't rotate on the center. So, yeah, so, so I'm going to be marking out exactly where the center of the object is and making sure that that is right on the center of that fulcrum point, make sure it's nicely leveled. Um, I'm probably not going to be doing this experiment here. I'll probably go somewhere where there's a little bit more space to, to make sure that we can do this. And then again, I can set this up. So one cart is double the mass. I will make sure to finely tune those masses so it, it works properly. Um, one is double the mass at half the distance. One is 
half the mass at double the distance. So again, those criteria. And I'll probably also try a three to one ratio. Well, again, the first experiment, in my opinion, is the one to one ratio. So the first experiment is to see how much of the momentum is conserved. Because if you can't conserve the momentum with the same masses, it gets a little bit pointless to talk about conserving it with uneven masses. Okay. And, you know, I'll, I'll probably do the full set, you know, regardless of what the uh, first one is, just so, again, we more data is probably going to be better. Um, I agree. And, I would like uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, well, I mean, I could just point out that when you're doing the experiment with the carts, you haven't done the experiment where you glean this much higher yield. So if you bang a one mass into a four mass or a five mass cart, your yield in extra momentum should be closer and closer to two. So, you know, instead of doing the experiment with this 133 thing, this tiny percentage of energy transfer, why don't you do it all the way and get the full maximum 199 momentums, you know, the, 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 the one, the, the 99 increase. Well, I would, I would argue that the previous experiments that I've done showing a, you know, 20 or 30 or 50% increase, I, I think I've gotten some with, you know, what you would argue is over 50% increase. Um, those were already verified. Again, I'm just, yeah, I, I, I didn't see the three to one. So I'm just saying I would like to see the experiment done where you're doubling the, the momentum, essentially, the 199 scenario, the 99% going you, where you get twice the momentum almost into the object. I mean, your theory says that I, if I make something barely move, it will be barely moving with twice the momentum. Yeah, so I, I would have to double check what the, uh, what the exact ratios would be to get incrementally closer because as that mass ratio increases you're just going to get incrementally closer to having uh that one object get twice the momentum uh basically because the other object completely reflects back um so yeah i'll, I'll try to get at least the one-to-one -one case the two-to-one case and the three-to-one case well i'm just saying i would the one i'm really interested to see is the one with the maximum output because that'll be the one hardest for me to debunk so if you can actually produce this close to to the momentum increase, that's a lot of free energy, in my opinion. And that's a lot for me to 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 go with. OK. Um, just trying to think of uh, other aspects of this experiment. Um, a couple of things for the for the lever itself. Um, I've got a couple of options here. Uh, I've got this just piece of dowel and I can measure some of the masses. So uh, the smallest cart mass that I have is around 300 grams. So that would be my like one mass in, in these cases. And this one, just for comparison, uh, it's around 60 grams. So it's a little heavier than I'd like, but trying to get something that is both a reasonable length so we can actually you know, be able to measure those distances with a, a reasonable fractional accuracy, um, something that is unyielding, long, and also very light. Uh, this was one of the best things I could get. Another option is uh, aluminum. And for this one, I was thinking we could do this in two cases, because again, we're making, um, I'd like to test the case where it's uh, rigid and the case where it's springy. So I was thinking this piece of aluminum, uh, its mass is a little bit less about, actually it's about the same. So 55 compared to the 300 that we're gonna use as a, as a minimum. Um, hopefully those are acceptably low masses, but I could mount it this way where along this axis, it's not gonna yield. And this way where we get a little bit of springy motion to it. And then we can test out both of those uh, particular conditions. And again, my understanding, and, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, um, my understanding is that you're convinced that the rigid case should give a faster launch velocity of the second object than the flexible case. Well, well my contention would be the flexible case is gonna shoot the uh, original object back. So you're gonna get a reflection. That would be my argument. 
So for the for the behavior of the second object, like you're saying, the the original object would be reflected back. Uh, but what about the second object? Do you have well, a the second object's going to get a lot less energy because of the fact that you've already absorbed the energy in the bending of the lever, and now the lever is just going to fling one object back, and the other object clearly can't gain that momentum because of the flex. The flex absorbed it. It's not going to transfer it through the the bearing. So you're saying. Uh, again, let me share my screen just so we can kind of compare these side by side. So again, my model is bouncy case. The second object should be flung at a higher velocity. And you're saying it should be a lower velocity in the bouncy case. Well, I, I, this isn't what I would call a bounce, okay? A flexing lever isn't a bounce. So that's that's like throwing a tennis ball against a brick wall is a bounce. Throwing a tennis ball against a rubber wall is another subject. How about instead, cart one, instead of just having cart one just be, uh, I'm probably going to put like a little foam in front of it so I don't actually damage the carts, but that should, you know, make it hit reasonably with, with reasonably little bounce. Or I could use the spring that's mounted on the front of those things to give it a little bit more of that kind of kickback bounce. Would well, that be... I don't think the bounce is a subject as long as you have the distances right. And just like I said, there's no bounce in a Newton's cradle. So I'm saying that the lever is essentially a conversion device and it's going to convert a high acceleration into a low acceleration and that a low acceleration into a high acceleration. So it's going to be doing the conversion just fine. I'm not interested in a flexible lever. So any experiment with a flexible lever, I really don't even want to speculate about what happens, frankly. I'm just interested in whether levers, the traditional thousand year old lever, conserves momentum. Okay, fair enough. Um, I, I'll still probably do that just partly for my own interest in seeing, you know, am I making these predictions accurately um, or not? But um, trying to think of any other, uh, any other aspects. So are, are you okay using, uh, another reason why I wanted to use the tracks um, instead of a pendulum is, I worried that the pendulum, when the thing hits the object, if it like slides against it and kind of pushes in different directions, I was I was a little bit concerned about those pendulums. And I think that we'd avoid that issue with uh, having the tracks. Everything's just gonna be along one direction. We're not gonna fling right. to the side. Well, I can just bring up little details. So you're very big on some of these detailed calculations. So you do know that when the cart's rolling, some of the energy is stored in rotational energy of the wheels. So the, some of the, the wheels for these carts are very small and very low mass. So I can uh, I can contact the manufacturer to see if they have like you know how much uh, what's the moment of inertia of those wheels. So I can I can check those numbers uh, to see how much of that is rotational energy. Yeah, well, I was just bringing it up as a piece of there's all these little variables. So I'm just saying that, you know, my basic intention is if the lever isn't going to be able to conserve the momentum, that is, you're not going to be able to get the Newton's cradle effect where the one going in doesn't produce the same thing going out. Now, if it's 80 percent, then we're doing OK ish, maybe 85 percent. But if you're really going to lose half the energy, then um, frankly, the experiment's kind of useless. From my perspective, it's I've lost interest. Again, the question would be, is the experiment useless or is has the model been successfully disproven? Well, I'm just saying it doesn't matter. We're saying that levers don't come anywhere close to conserving momentum, and that's all the answer I need. If levers don't conserve momentum, then we can take them off the list as a useful experimental device. Because again, this is this is again a little bit of a sticking point that I, I really want to hammer home because what we're comparing is not our levers do levers have one particular property what we're comparing is our two models of how momentum energy and angular momentum work right i'm, I'm just saying that if on its face we have to accept that you're saying that the, somehow the angular rotation consumes half the energy I'm arguing that, well, it's not going to do what the, I want it to do, which is I want a way to make a Newton's cradle with different masses. I want to get all the energy from one object into another object. You're saying levers can't do that. Well, then I have to find some other instrument that can. With, with the springy case, I'm saying the total energy 
of all of those pieces still gets conserved. I'm again using that total know, kinetic you know, like, energy. Okay, it's not the total momentum. So I'm just saying whatever. I don't want to argue. We all you know, this plus and minus scalar versus vector stuff, but I'm just saying that obviously from my perspective, it's not the same momentum because you canceled something. I, again, I really want to. I, I really want to get this point to to work. If I made a statement that you did an experiment and if it doesn't do what I expect it to do, then I'm not gonna say that your model has value. I'm gonna say the experiment, something is just wrong about how levers operate. My model holds true, but it's just not applied to levers anymore. Uh, look, if I was building some device and I found out that a gear is 50% inefficient, and I have planned to use 15 gears. Well, then I know, forget it. I can't make my machine because I'm losing half the energy with every single turn of the gear. So I'm just saying if levers turn out to be 50% inefficient at transferring energy or momentum, then clearly I can't use them for anything because every time I use them, they're losing half the energy. But our models are not specifically on how levers work or gears work, we're trying to identify how energy and conservation of momentum work in the universe as a whole. The fact that one lead, that one gear might have some friction on it or might have, you know, uh, uh, maybe the teeth of the gears are not quite evenly spaced or something like that, we should still be able to say, well, if we can detect those effects, we can account for it with our models because those are still objects in the universe. Look, you're, you're, we're talking past each other to some extent. It's like in your video, okay, you did the two cars crashing into each other, right? And yes. it's at zero momentum. Now, we know that if I put a crushable surface on those cars, we would see the deformation we would see the fact that the energy is being used to move pieces of the material itself and all of the energy will be dissipated as heat. So we know that it didn't just disappear. The momentum didn't just disappear. The momentum always has to go somewhere is my simple argument. All right. So when two cars crash into each other, there is no, the momentum disappeared. No, the momentum went into all this bent stuff. In the model that I propose and Again, what I demonstrated in the video, what I, I feel like I demonstrated successfully in the video, again, your mileage may vary. Um, what I tried to demonstrate in the video is even in the case where we have a spring, um, where the two objects hit, there's a spring, it compresses that spring, and then the objects fly off of each other. Okay? Um, this was the last experiment that I did, I think the last two experiments that I did in, uh, uh, in the video from yesterday. When we did that experiment, I was trying to show that even when that spring was compressed, both objects were moving in such a way that the total momentum was still staying the same. That compressed spring during that brief period, we saw no evidence of that momentum, that total momentum changing at any point during that collision. The total energy changed when I showed that energy graph of you know how much kinetic energy the system had, that dipped down and then came back. But momentum was solid across the board. And that's what Newton's model of momentum is talking about. As long as there are only internal forces, it doesn't matter if those forces are causing objects to deform or compressing a spring. As long as they are just internal forces to the system, the total momentum, adding momentum in one direction and subtracting momentum in the other direction, that total momentum will be conserved. You know, whatever, fine. I'm just saying that that makes absolutely no sense because I just do a slow motion camera. I can see the momentum's changing. I can see the two carts slow down. I can see it. So I'm just saying, go ahead and tell me there's no momentum there, but I'm going to argue that clearly the momentums are reducing. The carts are slowing down. They actually come to a stop. There's no momentum in the system, and we have to wait for the spring to give it to the two carts before we can see it again. Okay, the momentum doesn't disappear. I agree. It goes into the spring. So your position is that if I have, let's say there's a cart that's not moving and a cart that is moving, 
and we have a spring between the two. When that hits, the spring will fully compress, reach its maximum compression, whatever that is, again, it depends on how hard you throw it, whatever that maximum compression is, that'll happen first, and then the next cart will start to move. Is that your position? You're, you're muted right now. I'm saying both events will take place. So one will start accelerating as the other one starts decelerating and the spring is in the middle. So the spring is mitigating between those two. And that's why you get this unevenness. That's why it's not a Newton's cradle. It's because it can't just take the energy from one and give it to the other. It has to compress. It's storing some of the energy. Then it starts accelerating the one object. And then the spring starts releasing and it's pushing both ways. So it gives this one a little boost and it gives this one a boost. So I'm saying the energy ends up being the same energy you put in, comes back out. It just comes back out in this uneven form. I mean, when Again, I'm we're, more... we're disagreeing on how we're using terms momentum and energy because I think you're using them in the same... Momentum is motion. It's mass and velocity. And I'm saying that I agree that there is a definition of momentum and again, that definition of momentum is useful. I'm not saying it's not a physical thing, but there's also a definition of energy. There are two different things. And in that experiment, I showed that during that brief period when the spring was compressed, the total momentum of the carts that, was, that were being tracked, that total momentum was solid. It was not changing during that spring compression. I, I could just argue that that's a, the, a defect of your your calculator because it's doing an approximation it's doing an average okay it's not it doesn't see the exact moment of the compression of the spring it's not seeing that it's seeing an average and it's, so it's just averaged over it it happens so quickly it just averaged over the transition that the conversion from one thing to the next thing is happening faster than the sampling rate of your momentum detector and how did you identify that I identify it by the fact that clearly I can take a slow motion video and I can show the carts and I can show that they don't have any momentum. There's a certain point where they have zero momentum. It's so just again, fact. you're saying you're saying that one will fully compress it. If they have zero momentum, there has to be a point. If where they're equal carts mass are. carts, okay, let me qualify the statement. If they're equal mass carts and I crash them into a spring, okay, so they're equal masses, equal velocities, I crash them into a spring, yes, there will be a point where both carts are still. Obviously, if one cart has more momentum, I would argue the whole thing moves like a car crash, the whole experiment will move in a direction. So obviously there's still some momentums, all right? But I'm saying if I make the car crash happen in one single spot, bang, there is a point where both carts are stopped and the spring contains all of the momentum. Two things. Um, first, I was referring to one cart being stopped and the other cart moving. So we were talking about two Slightly different, but in a critical way, different experiments. Um, in the case where we've got two carts going equally, again, Newton's model of momentum, and I think that in the other video you said that if Newton is saying that we add momentum in one direction and subtract momentum in the other, that you disagree with Newton. You said you were going to like check on that. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to kind of read those references. Well, I, I reread it. I mean, obviously, reading Newton is. Uh arduous task okay because nothing is spoken in english originally it's all in this stupid latin he published in and you know i don't know why an englishman publishes in latin but anyway um and clearly what is a right line does a right line mean either direction on a straight line or what i mean so i'm saying it look newton explicitly does say i'll agree he says well i have something with 10 momentums and uh what if i give it 12 momentums to the other object well, I mean, obviously Newton's saying I can give something more momentum than I have. The bowling ball can hit the bowling pin and give it more momentum than it has. I don't think that can happen. I don't think Newton thought that can happen. So I'm saying there's something wrong with this verbiage. But regardless, I won't argue it. I'll just say I'll give you that one. Newton farted. Okay, Newton made a mistake, in my opinion, to suggest that a 10 momentum can give some other object 12 momentums. Again, in the experiment that I did yes that I did uh, uh, posted yesterday we saw one of those carts reflect backwards 
So yeah, I, I've, made, but yes, I've seen the experiment before and I've pointed out how Professor Lewin had to cheat the experiment to make it happen. And I've we've I've gone over hundreds, you know, well, let's say dozens of these experiments online. We have argued this over and over again. A guy made three different air tracks to do this specific experiment. He he did all this trouble and he's, his results are at best sloppy and ugly. OK, and he couldn't get it to work at all without springs. So there's all kinds of catches to this experiment. OK, I've never seen one done without the springs, even though the steel or the aluminum is perfectly elastic. Frankly, the Newton's cradle kind of proves that that you can have a perfectly elastic ex uh, exchange. OK, without using a spring. So there are all kinds of catches to this experiment. And it's and again, I'm still arguing that, well, why don't we do it in the most extreme way? where you actually do convert the two momentums into the other object. That would be really hard to deny, frankly. And can't you imagine that I could duplicate the experiment, right? If I had enough money, I could buy a lot of carts and I could stack them up. You know, I could have the one mass cart hit a two mass cart. Then I could have the two mass cart hit a four mass cart. Then I could have the four mass cart hit an eight mass cart. And then I could have the eight mass cart hit a 16 mass cart. And eventually I could create 400 momentums or 500 momentums. You could create more uh, momentum in that particular direction. Exactly. Because when the other objects reflect, when the heavier objects reflect off of it, there's momentum going in the opposite direction and Which I can ignore it. Out that total I can momentum. ignore that completely in my free energy machine. Okay. I don't have to care about that extra stuff you have going the other way. I can just pay attention to the forward motion and just say, I'm just going to keep collecting the extra. But I don't you need care to about generate that original that energy. You need to generate that original energy by how you set up the experiment. If you have that original object coming in to set off this chain reaction, um, you need to give that system some energy. So exactly, I give it I give it one volt and I get 10 volts out. No, you give it one amount of momentum and there is some different amount of energy associated with that. <laughs> yeah, well, you if say you do so. the one half hey, MV hey, squared. Your momentum doesn't mean anything. I push with a hundred pound guy, okay, uh, going five miles an hour and I end up with the momentum of a 500 pound guy pushing one mile an hour. So I'm just saying, I know it's more energy. I know it's more movement in the universe. There's no doubt it's more movement. If I hit it against a building, the building is going to know the difference between 100 momentum and 400 momentum. The building is going to be impressed. Yeah, there will be an impulse on that building, but that does not is not the same thing as energy. Momentum and energy. If I hit the building the with 100 momentums. Goal. And I hit the building with 400 momentums. You're saying they're the same thing. I'm saying no, clearly that's not, not the same it. thing. Well, okay. Well, I'm, I'm just saying you, you're you conceding my argument. 400 momentums is more momentum than 100 momentum. 400 momentums can always do more work than 100. Will you agree with that? No, because you added the term work in there. And work is associated with energy, not momentum. When we're talking about impulse, like your, your experiment with... Um, I, I watched your your ten videos on, um, you know the the free energy nut theory thing. Um, number six, you had uh, launching two unequal masses uh, with a spring inside a spaceship. Does it deflect a spaceship if you know the spring is in there and this is a one mass going uh, uh, twice as fast as a two mass going at one speed? And they had different energies. I agree, it does not deflect a spaceship if they move out of the spaceship. But how much, how that spring actually generates that motion at the beginning, that depends on energy, not momentum. That's the part that you're, you're, that we're disagreeing with in our models. If I want to generate that motion, I need to know how much energy Am I putting in? Not I, how well, much very conceded that we have this complete disagreement, okay? Because you did an experiment where in one experiment you used the same exact spring compression. One experiment, you got the carts to move with a one momentum, let's just say. And the second experiment using heavier carts, you got two momentums. Same exact explosion, you got two different total momentums out of the experiment. Now yes. I'm saying, okay, there's no explosion that can do that. So you have to explain the difference. Why did all this momentum, uh, the little bits flying out of the explosion, so to speak, how did they have a different effect? They have a certain amount of momentum. Momentum is transferred like Newton's cradle. It's transferred from one object to another object. 
I just can't imagine how the same explosion can create different amounts of momentum out. Because it's for the explosion, it's not the momentum that's important. The momentum is still conserved. I start with nothing moving, and afterwards I get momentas in opposite direction, and in Newton's model, those momentas cancel out to zero. I'm not saying 200 equals 400, as you've claimed multiple times, I'm saying zero equals zero in terms of the momentum of this system. For the spring, the spring stores energy. And that was what was not claimed, but demonstrated in that video, that the springs store energy. We have the same amount of energy. And when the two objects are launched, if I add up those energies, the one half MV squared for one, one half mv squared for the other, we get the same result. Right, okay, so I'm, I'm just arguing that there's no point in physics in talking about conservation of momentum because you're not taking its conservation seriously. So, okay, I got that. I absolutely am taking its conservation seriously by saying that by having a model of momentum that accurately represents that momentum has a direction. We have to include that direction. Are you arguing? It's an explosion, okay? It has opposite directions all the time. An explosion sends something this way. It sends something this way. It doesn't mean there's no energy. It Are doesn't you... mean any of that. It means there's real momentums moving this way, and there's real momentum moving that way. I fire a bullet. I put bullets in a gun. You're, you're saying to me, theoretically, that I can get more momentum out of the gun, a zip gun. I use a zip gun. So, you know, one bullet goes this way, one bullet goes this way. All right? You're saying the heavier I make the bullets the more energy I get out of the gun. And the lighter I make the bullets, the less energy I get out of the gun. Sorry, say that one, one more time. I want to make sure that I... I kind All of I have to do is make the bullets ultra light and I'll get two momentums. I make the bullets ultra heavy and I'll get 4,000 momentums. Yeah, if you, if you have a set amount of... Uh, I want to make sure I'm not getting this, uh, getting this wrong. If you have a set amount of energy, then the lower mass objects will be moving faster, but faster in a way that depends on the square root of the mass. Well, I'm just saying they're not going to be moving much faster because they're not producing the same momentum. So obviously that's not true. The, the, in your example of your card experiment, the lighter objects moved with more velocity, but not a proportionally more than the heavy objects. The heavy objects are moving with more momentum than the lighter objects. So the lighter I go, the less momentum I create. The heavier I go, the more momentum I create. Yes, because it depends on the square root of the mass in that one half mv squared equation. So if I, if I, uh, if I double the mass, the velocity shouldn't be cut in half. The velocity should be cut, should change by one over the square root of two. And that was what was demonstrated. It wasn't claimed. It was uh, demonstrated. And, I, and I'll, I'll say I have other experiments that demonstrate otherwise. Okay, again, so I could just point out the Newton's cradle doesn't do any of this. The Newton's the cradle absolutely disturbed. does. The one that you presented, the video that you presented in, uh, which one was it? Um, Six, I think. I thought there was another one with the... Uh, yeah, it has the videos. In, in, in one of them, you, you have a video of the Newton's cradle. And in the other parts of that video, they literally go through the calculations on how both momentum <laughs> in this direction <laughs> and no energy is conserved. He didn't measure anything. So that's just nonsense. He went through calculations that have nothing to do with anything measured. He didn't measure anything. So don't tell me that he did the calculations based on measurements. He didn't do with any measurements. He, he didn't measure. He didn't measure the, at the amplitude of the uh, the swings on either side of that. He didn't measure any of that. Okay, maybe, he, maybe he demonstrated. Tricky, he didn't but... measure it. He didn't use. He just used the calculated answer. He didn't show you how the calculations match what the actual pendulum did. Okay, maybe maybe I need to double check that. But even the even with that, we've got a model. You're saying that um, the model itself is inconsistent. But we've got a model where we can have both conservation of momentum and conservation of energy when we have elastic collisions under right, those right, conditions. 
Right, only in the condition that we have a, a vector notion of momentum and a scalar notion of kinetic energy where somehow magically the scalar energy can't subtract, but the vector energy does, blah, 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 blah. So we've already been over all that, right? If you can have negative momentum, your theory can work and conserve momentum. Obviously, I'm saying there's no such thing as negative momentum. There's no such thing as the explosion producing various amounts of momentum. It produces one amount of momentum. It has to bend something, it has to twist something, it has to move something. All the conversions have to be even. The bowling ball cannot decide to knock down more pins or less pins. It can only knock down what it has in momentum. It can only give away its momentum. Here's another important point. All of those things you said about experiments, those were all claims. Okay. When you, in a whole bunch of those different volumes, like, you know, just kind of looking through, um, volume one, uh, four, uh, six, seven, um, a whole bunch of them, you make claims as to how different systems will work. Okay. And you say, this should be the outcome. Uh, for example, in the first one, you say, if I had this stack of balls <laughs> and drop them and launch the other ones, you said, Oh, we can get like twice the kinetic energy or maybe even four times. You changed your answer on that one. You showed no calculation whatsoever. You showed no measurement of how the textbook model actually describes that system. You're not finding inconsistencies inside of the textbook model. You're saying there's inconsistencies between the textbook model well, well, please, and please. your model of how momentum works. And I agree with that. <laughs> Please, please go ahead and provide that, okay? Because Veritasium didn't do it. Physics Girl didn't do it. They've all done this experiment. It's been done a million times, okay? So this experiment is all over the place. So there's no doubt about the outcome. The outcome is clearly creating more kinetic energy than went in. There's no so, doubt about it. So you just explained to me how creating free kinetic energy is a viable universal concept. So I made a document that actually goes through the calculations for this system that you describe. We've got masses, and I just decided we need to make each mass smaller. So I went from 1 to 0.1 to 0.01 and just said, well, when they fall, the one at the bottom is always moving up uh, with this, with a certain, or sorry, the one at the top uh, above is always moving down with the speed and actually calculating what are the predictions from elastic collisions. So. For each one of these, I can measure, I can identify, again, I'm not going to go through the full math for this, but we can measure and you can take this video and go through these calculations to make sure I'm not just making these things up. We can say, if this was our setup, you know, a uh, uh, one kilogram object moving up at a speed of one meter per second and a tenth of a kilogram object moving down at one meter per second, when those reflect off of each other, these should be the velocities. I can measure the initial momentum, get a total momentum. I can measure the final momentum, get a total final momentum, and those match up. And then I can also look at the energy. The energy is also conserved. At the next stage, I can take this result and say, well, now that's the next stage for my next object. And we can go through the calculations by actually showing our work. You did not show any work. You just said- I don't believe in any of those formulas. So why would I concede to formulas I don't believe have anything to do with reality? I'm saying you can overtly look at the experiment. Part of the mass has been converted. There's no doubt about it. Masses that were moving very slowly are now moving insanely fast. 20, 30 times faster than they were moving in the downward direction. There is no doubt about the fact that it creates more kinetic energy. There's more they kinetic moving. energy flying in the universe after the experiment than before the experiment. Your calculations are irrelevant and irrational to sit there and claim it didn't happen. The experiment did happen. It did create more energy in the universe. You are claiming that the model of conservation of energy, the standard textbook model of energy makes contradictory statements that must be evaluated. If we're making a contradiction, it must be evaluated on that system's own properties. 
If I'm we're saying that, measure the energy of the balls before and after. Have the balls land on the ground made of non-rubber and, and see what their value of force they have collected is. And then calculate the force flying off of them. Okay, and there's no way those two force numbers equal each other because you have in fact taken pieces of the matter and you have in fact moved it faster. It's moving faster, maybe 20 or 30 times faster, but the masses involved are ridiculously tiny compared to the original masses. No, they're not ridiculously tiny. They are not ridiculously tiny. They are not. The experiment's done with golf balls, tennis balls, all kinds of different balls, and their masses are probably one, whatever, an eighth of the total mass of the basketball, okay, or a seventh or a sixth. So let's just say I can use a, a rubber ball, rubber super ball has been used. Those are pretty heavy. You can give me any numbers that I want, and it'll automatically update, and we can make a prediction. And we can see I'm, I'm that just saying, I want the, the energy measured. self-consistent. It's okay. not, I agree, it's not consistent with your model, but you'd have to actually do the experiment. All right, well, do it. Do the experiment where you actually collect the extra energy as joules. You actually collect it as watts. You actually collect it as real energy in some real form, and then tell me that the ball falling, okay, and the balls rising is exactly the same energy, because I don't think you can do it. I'm going to... Uh, pick out a point in my uh, in my other video, so we can actually look at some of these numbers specifically and test this model that I'm using. I have not done this yet, um, but let's look at uh, one of these collisions. So again, I want to make sure that I'm giving accurate results. So uh, we're going to use this third case. Actually, let's use the fourth case because that one was uh, more extreme. Okay, so. I used for mass one, that was 309, mass two was 806. So this is gonna be, uh, I need to make sure I'm using these uh, right. So this is uh, 309, 806. And the velocities, let me just move forward a little bit so we can find those velocities. Need the timer at four. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize that this is a little bit delayed. Okay, so we can get the velocity. The velocity of object one was 0.387. So velocity at impact or average velocity, what velocity is that? The velocity at this point in the motion, just before impact. So how does your computer know that ahead of time, where the impact is? Because it has motion sensors and you can actually see, if you watch the video, these this data is being displayed before the end of the thing is even on there before the end of the motion is. Even. I'm just saying it's obviously a velocity that has going to be in different places depending on where you put your carts and where you push them. So how does it know to select the velocity just before? Because I clicked it. All right, I didn't see you click it in the video you did yesterday. So I didn't see that happen. But yeah, okay. I, I can select where on this graph because I, I measured that velocity before. Uh, let me just record this. So uh, that's for the low mass cart. So this is 0 0.38, what's that one? 387. Uh, this one is zero. And according to this, uh, if I've done the math correct on here, the final velocity should be around negative 0.18 for object one and around 0.21 for object two. Let's see what we get. So, uh, I was expecting negative 0.17. I got negative 0.16. So within about, what is that? Around uh, uh, four or five percent. And velocity two should be uh, 0.214. I got 0.209. Again, within around uh, three or four percent. So are you still going to say that these measurements are... I'm, I, I don't know why the subject changed. We we're talking about the three ball bounce. I'm going to just make the simple argument to the Because viewers. the three ball I'll just bounce... Make, I'll, just make the, I'll just make this... Let me just say my two sentences or my three sentences. The simple argument is visualize the three balls falling. They're all going at the same velocity. Okay. After the experiment, the only one that's going slower is the big basketball. So it's going to go slower. 
but the other two balls have increased their velocity a lot, okay? And those velocities are all squared functions by kinetic energy. So just understand that a percentage of the total mass has been converted to a much faster velocity. But the mass of that other object is a lot smaller. So I'm not, I'm again, not, you can I'm go not, through the calculations and check um, a, a, and check my work to see, you know, if I do m times v for each of these, we've got the masses, we've got the I velocities. Know, but you have your math says that the ten ton train, the five ton train going ten miles an hour hits the five ton train, combines into a ten ton train, and conserves the momentum, and yet loses half the kinetic energy. And yeah, because when they stick together there's going to be deformation between those objects. Oh, right, and the argument is that any of that deformation momentum. has to be created by momentum. You cannot make deformation without using something's momentum. You can't make heat without using something's momentum. You can't make any kind of movement in the universe without using something else's movement. So there's no way you could have retained all of the movement and yet moved a bunch of other things. This was the collision where I had the springs uh, launch the carts off of each other. Okay. This is my kinetic energy. This is my total energy. During the collision, the total energy stays, sorry, the total momentum, I apologize, total momentum stays constant. Uh, 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 right, right. Okay. The energy uh, dips okay. down when the springs compress, and then it gives that energy back. It's clear, it both, it's clear that both carts are not going to conserve momentum. So again, your chart can say that's exactly what happens, but we know your sampling rates aren't perfect. So you can say that these sloped lines exactly duplicate what the spring is doing. All right, that it, one thing is going faster at the same rate, the other thing is going slower. I'm saying the experiment happens way too fast and you're just got average data. You've averaged over something happening, you know, you're using, um, you know, whatever, tenths of a second, and the event is happening in hundreds or thousands of a second. The sample rate was 50 hertz. It's taking one uh, sample every 0.02 seconds. You can see that in the time values over here. And this collision took about 0.1 seconds. So that's at least five samples in there. Um, your statement is false for that one. All right, well, whatever, crash the two objects into each other and then see what it does. I did, it's right here. Where's crashing into each other with the same mass? Oh, well, it doesn't, matter. Are... it doesn't matter, I'll, I'll accept this. So you're saying these are two different masses hitting each other and you have exactly the same line. Okay, so fine. That's fine, I'm saying there's a point where both of those objects aren't moving and that's a fact. So is that point right here when they both have some momentum? I'm saying they both don't have any momentum if they're not moving. So you can keep saying they're moving. You can, I'm saying your chart is gonna fill in any blanks in the line. So whatever, I'm just saying, whatever. you sell your product, I'll sell my product, okay? Because on this one, we totally disagree. I don't think there's any way that this data proves that the two carts didn't stop moving. So, See if we can actually get the uh, the video of that and do a frame by frame. Uh, it's probably going to be more time. No, it's just one cart banging into another cart. I just said two carts moving, but okay. So never mind. If if both carts are moving again with the same momentum, then in that case I agree. But are you saying that your model for momentum only works under a super super specific case? No, I'm saying that each case is very different. I'm saying two th two cars hitting each other is different than one car hitting another car, that the physics is different. The momentums are gonna be completely different. The accident's gonna look different. And again, my model, no matter what forces are actually interacting between them, if they're only internal forces, you'll still get conservation of momentum. Not I'm necessarily saying, but they won't get that straight line across. You won't get that straight line saying there's no momentum because there will be a point where the spring has all the momentum and the carts have zero momentum. So you're conceding my point that it doesn't work in that special case. I am definitely not conceding that point. I'm saying we can identify it right here. And if we have the accurate model of momentum, then everything works out very, very well. Okay, so, let's just understand. I'll, I'll just paraphrase you. He's saying two carts can plow into each other. I take a slow motion film of it. You can see the carts actually stop. Okay, they're not moving. 
the spring's not moving, nothing's moving, and then they go re-expand out. He's saying that doesn't happen. The carts never lose their momentum. They still have the momentum, even though they're not moving. I said that if they have equal momentums in opposite directions, I said that, yes, that total momentum is zero, and we can actually get a point where both carts stop. No, I was so asking just, you, yes. so is just, that the only case where your model of momentum works? Because mine works in that case, saying there's zero total momentum, so they will momentarily come to a stop, but also in cases where one object is not moving and I launch another object. Or maybe one object is moving just a little bit and I launch another object. Of course, I'm saying my theory fits all cases, but regardless, I'm just saying, you know, I'm saying to you, clearly you said that the momentum is a flat line, okay, that it, it never, the, the momentum never goes into the spring. You used it for the argument to say the momentum never goes into the spring. I'm making the clear argument that in that case, clearly the, all the momentum went into the spring. I've highlighted your model of the momentum and how much we start with and how much we end with. After these two, are any of those momenta equal? I'm not going to debate your experiments, just like I'm not going to debate the other 35 varieties of experiment. I can go to I, you know, Ian Gosling's channel and we can see all kinds of numbers for the experiment. So one day, it, the, the twice the mass compresses this, the clay half as much. The next day, it's three quarters. You know, the numbers are all over the place. So you, I, you want to say, that you want to say, you want to say that every experiment is perfect, and I have to accept every single experimental result. And I'm saying, well, I'm frankly arguing the implications of the experiment. And I'm saying, fine, if eventually you convince me of the existence of kinetic energy. I'm going to go into the free energy business. Okay, that's all I'm saying to you. I see the implications as being free energy all over the place. And if it's actually happening, I'm going to build the machines. Sure, if that's how you want to, if that's how you want to spend your time. But I just want to kind of clarify, I am bringing data, data that I've done multiple trials on and the textbook model matches to a high degree of accuracy your model does not okay so do you're your not going to argue the experiment I'll, then I'll, it's going to be data i'll give you the plan. link to me doing the simple oscillating lever experiment and you can apply your calculations and prove it didn't happen okay we can do I'd, that i'd appreciate getting that link. i would appreciate that um i think that's all i think that's all i have uh i'll, I'll let you have the last word on uh on any of this let me uh stop the share so uh, if you want to have any kind of closing comments. Well, I think the important thing on the lever, like I said, if you prove that levers don't transfer the energy from one side of the lever to the other side of the lever efficiently, then there's no point in talking about levers any further. So I'm just frankly saying, yes, if levers are that inefficient, I never realized they were that inefficient. But if they are, if it turns out they are, um, then you don't, you know, the rest of it is all moot to me. Okay. But um, I don't think they'll turn out that way. But anyway, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. I, I, will, I will try to do the experiment and, and get as high quality data with multiple ways of kind of verifying it. And I, I hope that when we get the results, um, I'm, I'm hoping that you're willing to not only consider that maybe it's a problem with levers, that it might be a problem with your model of momentum. Because again, the, the whole kind of purpose as I see it, you might have a different purpose here. As I see it, we have two different models for how we think momentum and energy work. And if we're both just making claims, again, I've, I've made some claims in here of what I think is going to happen. If that's all we were doing, we would not be able to distinguish who is right or whose model is more accurate. Yeah, yeah. To rely on I'm saying there has to be volumes of experiments. Again, the Eddington experiment proves Einstein right. Now, do you think that's credible? Do you think that's all there should be is the Eddington experiment? And all of the many follow-ups that have been done. Yes. No, no, it's never been repeated, okay? Visual optical light hasn't been done. Well, we'll have to set that one aside. Um, so uh, I, I do wanna thank you again for, for taking part. Um, sorry that we, we didn't really get to any, I don't know if there were any questions or just comments in there. I, I haven't been able to kind of watch the chat too much, but. Uh, I, I, again, I do appreciate you uh, uh, taking part in this and uh, 
Hope everyone uh, had yeah, a good rest I, of the I'm insanely grateful. Uh, you know, want to maybe send you a Christmas present or something. But anyway, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to challenge your physics. And um, we'll see how it goes, because we'll see if we can find some experiments that demonstrate this stuff in a really explicit way. OK, good enough. Uh, all right. Hope everyone's uh, in the chat. Anyone watching this later is doing well. And uh, yeah, have a good rest of your day. Okay, so I just ended the stream. Um, 